Hello, I'm Valerie Jackson, coming to you from the Cecil B. Day Chapel at the Carter Center here in Atlanta, with a very special evening as we go between the lines of Fall of Giants, book one of the Century Trilogy by one of the world's most popular and prolific fiction writers, Ken Fowlett. Ken, who has authored 26 books, several of which have been made into TV miniseries or motion pictures, as in the case of his first bestseller, Eye of the Needle, starring Donald Sutherland and Kate Milligan. But after Eye of the Needle and a series of other best-selling thrillers, including The Man from St. Petersburg and Lie Down with Lions, Ken surprised readers by venturing into historical fiction with The Pillows of the Earth a novel about building a cathedral in the Middle Ages. The Pillars of the Earth received rave reviews and international acclaim. In London, the Times readers were asked to vote for the 60 greatest novels of the last 60 years. The Pillars of the Earth ranked number two, only following To Kill a Mockingbird. The sequel to The Pillars of the Earth, World Without End, features the descendants of the original characters. It was a number one bestseller in Italy, US, Germany, the UK, France, and Spain. As a matter of fact, in Spain, it was the fastest selling book ever published in the Spanish language. When he's not writing, Ken is very involved with literacy action programs and other civic activities in his hometown of Stevenage, I believe it's pronounced, Stevenage, England. He was a former newspaper reporter and deputy managing director for a publishing house before his list of blockbusters. But Ken's creative talents aren't just limited to writing and literature. He also plays bass guitar in a blues band named Damn Right I Got the Blues. <laughs> it's a pleasure to welcome to the Carter Center, Ken Fowlett. Well, Ken, thanks so much for talking with us today. It's a and pleasure. I've got, to, I've got to admit, when I first looked at the book, and I, it was practically a 1,000 pages, I said, what have I gotten myself into here? But I must say, I never tired once of reading it. As a matter of fact, I read several chapters twice. But it's, a, it's, it's, it's really Fall of the Giants is a novel in your planned trilogy, as I mentioned, about the 20th century. Um, wherein you follow five families throughout the century. But I have to ask you, five families throughout 100 years, what prompted you to take on such a tremendous endeavor? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm 61 years old. If I'm going to do something ambitious, this is probably the right moment to start. <laughs> uh, if, you know, if I want to finish it. Uh, what really what happened was that... Uh, uh, World Without End um, really surpassed my expectations. You know, the, the response of, of readers around the world to that book was so warm. I was so thrilled by that uh, that, that I wanted it again. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, and I didn't want to, go, after writing World Without End, I didn't want to go back to writing thrillers, which is easier, by the way, you know, a thriller when you're writing a thriller, you write 100,000 words and you're finished. Whereas with a book like Fall of Giants, you write 100,000 words and you've only just started. So thrillers are easier, but uh, uh, the, I, I had come to enjoy the challenge of writing longer books, and I'd come to realize that readers like longer books if they're good, of course. Right, that's right. the. <laughs> Uh, of course, if, you've, if you're reading a long book and it's a little dull, you really you start to look at how many more pages have I got to get <laughs> through, you know, which is the worst thing. But, but if, if people are enjoying a book, they like it to be long. And I get emails from readers saying things like, uh, I just read The Pillars of the Earth and I, I, I didn't want it to end. I wished it was a longer book. And that's, that's uh, a thousand pages. So, um, so I wanted to write something uh, that would be like World Without End in that it would give me that sweep and scope 
but on the other hand, I didn't really want to do another medieval story, at least not right away, uh, because you know, I had taken three years to write World Without End, and three years in the Middle Ages is, in, is enough. <laughs> you know, at one, at one go. So, so I was looking for something else, and I'm thinking about what, you know, I'm talking to people, to my editors and my family about what I might do next, and I thought of the 20th century, which is the most uh, dramatic and violent period in the history of the human race. And you think about it, you know, we killed we killed so many of one another in the 20th century in wars and pogroms and bombings. And, uh, uh, and yet, and it's, it's also our century. It's, I lived through half of it. Uh, most of my readers lived through part of the 20th century. And uh, our parents and grandparents lived through the rest of it. So it's the story, to some extent, of where we come from. And when I saw it that way, then I thought, yes, I could write about the 20th century. Well, the fall of giants opens in 1911 in a Welsh mining town where a 13-year-old boy, Billy Williams, is quitting school to begin a life working in the mining pits, owned by a British you know, aristocrat, Fitzhubert. Draw a picture of British society for us at that time and how the aristocrats and the laborers coexisted or not, as in the case of Billy and Fitzherbert. Well, it, the, the, the book opens, Fall of Giants opens in a uh, mining town in South Wales, and that's where I come from. My mother was born and raised in a coal mining town in South Wales. And uh, my grandfather, Evans, my mother's father, did exactly what Billy Williams does in the opening scene of Fall of Giants. My grandfather, at the age of 13, went down the pit, as they say. That's to say he went underground to begin his working life as an apprentice coal miner. So this, this is, all this stuff is familiar to me. In most of those towns in South Wales, there's a big house because somebody, somebody owns that coal that's underground, and it's usually a big landowner. So uh, more then than now, there was a very kind of dramatic social divide. There were hundreds of men who went underground every day to win the coal, and then there would be one family, usually a little way up the mountainside in a big house, who were uh, getting a royalty. And the owner of the mineral rights made about the same amount of money per ton of coal as the miner who dug it. So uh, he was often a very, very rich man. So there was that divide. Now, of course, we, I mean, everybody knows that there were these divisions. There have been these divisions in society, but it's very dramatic in a novel. The, if these people live quite close together, they're bound together. They can't, uh, they can't really be separate. They pretend they, they're separate. They pretend they're different. They're like from different planets or something, but they're not, and they meet. They, they quarrel. They argue. They fall in love sometimes. People move from one class to another, and all that creates drama. And so one of the ways in Fall of Giants in which I create drama, one of, the, one of the sources of the stories in this book is those divisions, the mm -hmm. class divisions and other divisions, national divisions. Well, you are right, as you say, that they actually are very interrelated in spite of the fact that they assume that they're separate because Billy's sister, Ethel, in fact, is good friends with Maud, who is Fitzherbert's, and we'll call him Fitz, as you do in the book, yeah. who was Fitz's sister. So already we've got the, the two families interacting. Yeah. But Ethel, let's talk about Ethel and Maud for, for a moment, because these were both two very strong women. Yes. Uh, Ethel, uh, the working class girl, the sister of Billy, the young coal miner, and Maud is the sister of Fitz, the coal owner. And what they have in common is that they're suffragettes. They're fighting for women's rights, in particular the vote. They want the vote for women. And that brings them together across the class divide because they actually both suffer from another form of oppression. And Maud, even though she's wealthy and privileged, she feels, nevertheless, she feels oppressed because, for example, she wasn't allowed to go to university the way her brother did. She's much smarter than her brother, but she feels that she's been deprived. And they, so they, both women have their very strong personal reasons. Because even the upper class women had a lot of restrictions at yes. that time. Talk about that a bit. 
Um, just one of my um, one of my editors uh, said uh, to me, "The sex in this book is great. All those frustrated Edwardians." <laughs> and uh, and that certainly that was an issue for somebody like Maud. In in this era, we're talking now about 1914. She was not allowed to go anywhere alone, which is kind of odd um, for a woman uh, of uh, 21 who is in love with a man that she's planning to marry. She, she never gets to be alone with him. And uh, they're both grown-ups, and there are certain things that they want to do, you know, even, even before they're married. They want to they they start down that road, you know what I mean. <laughs> and uh, it's very difficult for them. So when they do manage to grab uh, 30 seconds or a couple of minutes on their own, um, it gets quite steamy. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that when you read the book, you'll, um, you'll agree with me, agree with my editor, who said that those bits are pretty good. <laughs> Did they, have, they had ways, though, probably, of getting around some of those restrictions. Do you know, I read an interesting thing. I lived for 17 years in a house in Chelsea in London. And while I was living there, the, the diaries were published of a young woman who had lived in my house mm. in that era. And she, uh, she didn't get married till she was 30. I think she must have been a, a, quite a fierce young woman. But she eventually got married when she was 30. And then her diaries end. But she relates how... She sat in, uh, and it, in, in the dining room. She and her fiancé, over dinner, would start an argument over something stupid. What's the capital of Bulgaria? And uh, they would say, we'll have to look it up. And the library was next to the dining room. <laughs> and uh, it, it, of course, it struck me very forcefully, because this was my house, and I knew these rooms. You know? <laughs> and uh, so she and, and they would go from the dining room into the library, and that was their few moments together. And that's when they would do what in England is called snogging. <laughs> which, what is it called in America? S smooching, I suppose. Making out? Or making out. Or maybe. Or okay. Making out. Yes, they would make out for a few seconds while they were pretending to look something up in the encyclopedia. And that, of course, is the source of the, the scene in, um, in Fall of Giants, where Maud does exactly this. She says that the Volga River passes through um, uh, Bucharest, Bucharest, I think it is, and he says, no, it doesn't, and she says, yes, it does. And he says, he realized, he knows that she knows that that's wrong, uh, but he realizes she's up to something, so he plays along with it, and then they go and look it up in the encyclopedia. And she says, well, I'll, I'll prove it to you. I'll, that's I'll right, to yes, you. that's I'll right. I'll take yeah. you to this and show so, it to yeah. you. Well, so that, was, that scene was based on, like on something that, that really yeah. happened. <laughs> well, you made women's suffrage a central concern in the novel. Mm. Why is that? Well, it's, it's, I think, one of the biggest uh, dramas of the 20th century is the change in the role of women in our society. Uh, we've been talking about some of the restrictions, but in general, at the beginning of the 20th century, everybody was agreed that women were inferior, they were weak, they were less intelligent, they were too emotional, and the best thing for them to do was to obey their husbands. And uh, there were very few people disagreed with that, really. Now, if I say that to my granddaughters today, they find it very hard to believe. <laughs> People really thought that, they say to me, slightly aggressively, you know, as if it's my fault. <laughs> and I say, yes, the people did really believe it. And you have to thank your, your mother and your grandmothers, because they were the ones who fought against that. And, and that's the great thing about it, of course, because women in the 20th century fought these political battles, which were very difficult. The suffragettes demanding votes for women uh, in, in most Western countries, not just, I deal with it in Britain, but uh, same sort of thing happened here in the United States and in other countries, France. And uh, women fought those battles. They were very harshly treated by the newspapers and by the police and so on. But they stuck it out and they had the guts to keep going and they won. They won that battle. So that's one of the dramas. You, you know, I was surprised that Maud and Ethel, who both worked so hard for suffrage, um, in the end, though, uh, had a different opinion about the voting bill that was, yeah. that was up because 
Maud didn't want to vote for it because she said it was just a fake. And of course, Ethel said, well, we should be lucky we're getting anything. Um, why do you think Ethel, I'm not Ethel, but Maud, why do you think Maud didn't want to accept it after they worked so hard for the vote? Now, of course, there were many restrictions on it. Yeah, uh, that's You know, the you problem. had to be 30, you had to be a household married to a, well, you, you, you tell about it. Well, the, 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 men, the men had to give in in Parliament, but uh, they did something very crafty. They gave the vote to women over 30, and, and men had the vote over 21, and that split the suffragettes. So that was a drama. Some said, look, let's be practical. We've been fighting for this for years. Let's, let's take what we can get and fight to reduce the age. Others said, there's a principle here. Women and our, what we're fighting for is that women and men should be treated equally. And to give the vote to women over 30 just, just, just continues the prejudice. So you can see that, that there's no ideological answer to that. It's just the, the attitudes that they take. And that split the movement, that weakened feminism. Uh, I don't know whether those men actually knew that they were being that clever, but they did do something <laughs> that they re really weakened feminism for about 10 years until, they, until the women won the vote for for uh, under 30s, for 21 to 30. And of course, that kind of thing in politics, one of the things that makes those political battles interesting is that people's emotions are invested in them. So if two people are comrades and fight shoulder to shoulder, and then they differ over something like that, the friendship cracks, and it's a terrible tragedy. Well, Maud, um, who was Fitz's sister and the, the, um, the mine owner, Maud was rebellious in more ways than just the women's rights because she was, as some people would say today, sleeping with the enemy. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Walter, the German. Well, I, I, ha I wanted to tell the story of the, the countdown to the First World War. It's something that most of us know a bit about, but we don't really understand. We know there was an assassination in Sarajevo and six weeks later, the whole of Europe was at war, and eventually uh, uh, the United States and Japan as well as Europe. But those six, in those six weeks, something very strange happened. Uh, a war started that nobody wanted, and I wanted to tell that. And, but I, you know, this isn't a history book, and I don't, I don't, you know, I don't like dry as dust history any more than anybody else does. So, how was I going to tell this story? Uh, and, and, and make it dramatic and personal. So what happens is that Maud falls in love with a young spy who's at the German embassy in London, Walter, or Walter. And uh, the two of them are in love and they want to get married. So they, and they're absolutely in the, in the swim, as it were. They know everything that's happening in the, these diplomatic maneuverings, one way and another. And so, as the world, as Europe takes these small steps towards the war that nobody wants, for, for Maud and Walter, these are steps towards a situation when they won't be able to be together. They want to get married. They're in love. They want to get married. But that can't happen if their countries are at war. So for them, it's not just a countdown to war. It's terrible suspense, because if this happens, then it's going to blight their romantic lives. Completely. So that was the way, in a way, that's, that's kind of the reason for the romance, because uh, I, wanted, I wanted those two to be the ones through whose eyes we see this diplomatic maneuvering. Well, the, um, before I ask you this next question, I must say, though, that for those, for my listening audience, if you've just joined us, I'm Valerie Jackson, and I'm going between the lines with Ken Fowlett at the Carter Center. His epic novel, Fall of Giants, offers a provocative view of the First World War, the Russian Revolution, and the struggle for women's suffrage in the early 20th century. Now, while Britain and Germany were playing do -si do so to speak, in terms of trying not to go to war, meanwhile in Russia, there's a revolution going on, or about to go on. The peasants are revolting, revolting against the Tsar. And there are two brothers there in Russia, two orphan brothers. Let's talk about them, the, the Peshkov brothers. Well, that's another part of the book that's loosely based on a true story. A friend told me about 20 years ago, 
a friend told me about his mother who uh, uh, was born in Russia. She had two brothers and they were saving up to go to America. And they got enough money for one ticket and they sent their sister, the younger, the youngest of the three. And she went to America and then World War I broke out. The two brothers were conscripted into the Russian army. They fought in World War I. They became revolutionaries. They were Bolsheviks. They were involved in the St. Petersburg Soviet and the storming of the Winter Palace. And they completely lost touch with their sister in America. And years later, when she was pushing 90, she saw an ad in the Los Angeles Times from a private detective said, send me $100 and I'll put you in touch with your long lost relatives in Russia. She sent him $100 and her son, my friend, said you will never see $100 again and you will never see that private detective. And he was wrong. And the private detective contacted her brothers and after all that time, she actually went to Russia. This is, this is still in the Soviet era, by the way. She went to Russia and she finally met her brothers, by now retired, but grand old men of the revolution. And they said to her, we're not, we're retired now, we're not in power anymore, but we still know a few people and we think we can get you over here. <laughs> Isn't that funny? They thought she was the unlucky one living in California, wearing a mink coat, driving a Cadillac, and they felt so sorry for her because she'd missed out. Anyway, that gave me the idea for Grigory and Lev, who are two brothers who want to go to America. One of them does go to America, and one of them stays behind. So we have two brothers. One is living the American dream, and the other is a revolutionary. And I just thought that would be such a nice, dramatic way to tell contrasting stories in the 20th century. As a matter of fact, you show how the uprising against the brutal regime of the Tsar actually led to the rise of the Soviet dictatorship, which, which came later. How much sympathy was there in the US at that time for the Bolshevik revolution or movement? Well, in the US and in the UK and all over the world, there was a lot of sympathy for the Bolsheviks because everybody knew that the Tsar's regime was very tyrannical. It was very brutal. It was completely undemocratic. And so free-thinking people had high hopes for the Russian Revolution. And it took, it, and, and of course the Russians themselves, I mean it wasn't, you know, but the Bolshevik party was easily the most popular party in, in Russia in that crucial period between uh, March and October 1917. When the, when the period when the Tsar abdicated, there was a provisional government, there was a revolution. The Bolsheviks were popular, so it wasn't just in foreign countries. And it's, it's, it's kind of a grim story to read now because we know how things turned out. But I, I felt it was important to understand why a Russian factory, like, factory worker such as Grigory would feel that the, this party was the party in which to invest all his hopes. Then, of course, some people were very quick to see what was going wrong. The, the, the philosopher Bertrand Russell, British philosopher Bertrand Russell, visited um, uh, Russia after the re revolution and wrote a, a book pointing out how badly wrong the revolution had already gone. But a lot of people didn't want to believe that because people had such high hopes. Because in fact, the Bolsheviks had become almost as brutal as the Tsar, is that correct? Uh, to a certain degree? More so, I would more say. So? More so? I mean, by the time Stalin was in power, it, it, it yeah. was worse. They yeah. killed more yeah. people than yeah. the Tsar ever did. So very, very quickly, it's a tragedy. Uh, and, you know, look, in fiction, sometimes there are tragedies and sometimes there are happy endings. That particular story mm -hmm. is, has a tragic ending. Well, Lev, who was the brother, eventually makes it to America, and that's a very, very interesting story, too, that we don't have time to go into. But uh, he, he made it to America, America where Woodrow Wilson is promising America that he will keep them out of the war. Well, one of Wilson's eyes and ears was a young man named Gus Dewar, or Dewar? Dewar. Dewar. Yeah, Dewar. Like uh, the whiskey. Son of a, yes, that's what I wondered if it was. 
<laughs> son of a U.S. senator and law student. How is it that Gus became uh, such an integral part of Wilson's inner circle? Well, I had, to, I had to make Gus lucky, really, because I really wanted somebody in the White House for all these terrific dramas, uh, the, particularly the whole drama of, of whether or not the United States would enter this terrible European war. Uh, so I wanted somebody who could be there to see what was going on. And so my main American character is this very bright young man, young l lawyer. Uh, and, uh, but I had to give him, look, how does he get to be an assistant to Woodrow Wilson? Well, you, you don't get that by writing a letter, uh, sending a letter to the White House, do you? So he has connections. His father is a senator and uh, is uh, very highly, very well connected. And so... Uh, uh, his father is able to, Gus goes on a kind of European tour and he sends back to his father rather witty letters about what's happening in Europe as Europe, just, U Europe moves towards war. And his father shows them to the president and says, this will amuse you. And the president says, you know, I'd like to have that bright young man working in my office. So that's how Gus gets to be uh, an insider. And then, of course, he can see everything that happens. Well, what eventually changed America's mind in terms of um, Wilson deciding that we did have to go to war? Well, um, uh, that's a good question. Um, and uh, uh, I, think, I think Wilson became convinced that um, world, the world economy would never, would never return to normal if somebody didn't step in and finish this war off. Uh, it, it was a big, the, the big emotional stories were, were, had to do with the sinking of ships. Um, of course, when, 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 um, um, when American citizens were killed because the German submarines sank ships, not necessarily American ships, but if they sank a British ship with Americans aboard, then the American people became very angry about that. And however, the, the Allies were being kept afloat by supplies from America, so the pressure on the Germans to sink these ships was terrific. So in the end, the Germans declared all-out submarine warfare and started to sink ships uh, willy-nilly. And uh, the the American people wouldn't stand for that. Uh, and Wilson uh, was kind of, well, he was, it's a subtle thing. I think, I don't think he was that reluctant to go to war, but he wanted to seem reluctant. He needed an excuse, or he wanted the exactly. Americans to say, you've got to go he, to war. He wanted yeah. public opinion to push him into the war. So he was a bit like a, a sort of, uh, I don't know, a reluctant bride. <laughs> he was saying, no, 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 uh, but being dragged to church all the same, you know. Uh, but it was really, but it was really, that, that war could have destroyed the, all of world trade if it had gone on much longer. You know what, there was, there was a big, in the, in the book, you talk about some Americans that got very upset because there was a reporter, Rosa Hellman, who reported a ploy by the Germans, supposedly, to pay Mexico to invade Texas. Yeah. And uh, so Americans obviously got very angry about that and wanted Wilson. The Zimmerman but, telegram. Okay, that's The right, Zimmerman right, telegram. Right, right, Was that for real? Oh, that's was... real, yeah, that's real. The, the German foreign minister was called Arthur Zimmerman, and he sent a telegram to the German ambassador in Mexico saying, and it's going to make you laugh, because it is a dopey idea, but it is real, saying, see if you can get Mexico to invade America, the United States. And uh, uh, this, this, it was a, a, the telegram was in code, but the British had a very good decoding section. And the British picked up this telegram and decoded it and uh, realized that it was hot stuff. The British realized that uh, this could inflame uh, American public opinion. Uh, and um, so it was, uh, it was, it was, it was this letter, this, this telegram was released, but in a subtle way, it was, it was leaked to the New York Times. <laughs> and so that it didn't seem to come from anybody official, right. but of course it did. And uh, then when Americans learned of this, this plan of Arthur Zimmerman's, 
they were they were absolutely smoking with rage. Well, Wilson used her that reporter in a way. Um, but do you think that the media played a fair role overall in the period leading up to the First World War? World War. Well, the, the newspapers, when we say media, of course, we mean newspapers. Well, There's no then, radio yes, and television right, there, right. although there were newsreels. There were cinema newsreels. Um, the media were very quick to whip up hatred against whoever was the enemy. And certainly in, in, all, in all of the European countries, the newspapers all carried stories, hate stories about the enemy. So British papers had hate stories about the Germans. German papers had hate stories about the British. It was, it was, it was as if they wanted to whip up uh, the emotions of people to make them more willing to fight. I don't think people needed whipping up, actually. I mean, <laughs> they seem to have gone to war um, with amazing willingness. Well, it, it all started with the assassination in, in Serbia, but, and, and then Austria was going to teach them a lesson. Yeah. But, but I think what happened was those were basically small guys, yeah. but then they had allies, though, who were big guys. Yeah. Serbia had Russia. Uh, exactly. Austria had, who was Germany. Austria? Germany, right. And so it seems to me that, there, that this whole system of, of, of alliance uh, contributed to the war, where, because those two small countries probably wouldn't have gone to war if they didn't have a big brother that was going no, to And nobody them. would have cared if they did. If, nobody cared about Serbia. Uh, um, no, you're absolutely right. It, there was a system of alliances that forced one country to come to the aid of another. And, um, but you know the other fact, that people had no idea how awful it was going to be. Everybody thought it was going to be over by In Christmas. three months. We've heard that before. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. And the, um, <laughs> uh, one of the ironies was that a, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, soldiers from the Indian subcontinent came to France to fight on the Allied side. So India was part of the British Empire. Uh, and um, they, they were told that they would be all right in their tropical uniforms because the war would be over before the weather turned cold. So, uh, so all, these, uh, all these troops from India, uh, you know, many of whom had never really seen cold weather, uh, were shivering in these tropical uniforms. And so, so that was, and then what they didn't understand, here's what, they, here's what nobody knew the new weapons that we had invented, mm. the, uh, the big artillery, the big guns, and the machine guns yes. made war so much more terrible than it had ever been before. And nobody realized that. Uh, and, and that's really, uh, and, and so the two sides were pretty much stalemated for four years, just, just mowing each other down. Uh, there's some bright periods in this book, by the way. I know, <laughs> I know what you, you know. There's lots of there's romance and good things happen, and uh, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. <laughs> Speaking of romance, <laughs> one of the reasons why I was so rather surprised that everyone went to war uh, was because there were so many affairs going on between the, the countries and so many interrelated families. A monarch of one country could be the uncle of the, you know, the czar yeah. of another. Um, what, how, do, how did they get around that? How, do, how, do, how, does, how does the world work when you've got all those interrelationships, yet you've got to be very political? Well, I think it was a sign of the times. The fact that that the Tsar and the Kaiser and the King of England were all relations, they were cousins. Uh, the fact that they were all, um, they were grandchildren or, or grandchildren-in-law of Queen Victoria, all of them. And, th and that made very little difference, and I think that was a sign of the times. I think it was a sign that, that they weren't, they were no longer making those decisions on their own. They didn't really have the power because their generals would say to them, you can't do this. You must mobilize your army. You must invade. Otherwise, your country will be in danger. So it's kind of a sign that, that kings were already beginning to lose their grip on power. Who were or who are the giants that fall in the book? Well, they are those, they are those great rulers, the Tsar of Russia, uh, the Austrian emperor, 
the Sultan, who was uh, who who commanded the who ruled the the Ottoman Empire, mm. uh, and the Kaiser. Uh, these these were terrific, powerful dynasties that that no longer existed at the end of the First World War. Mm. Mm. So the giants fell, and and a new world. And I also wanted to write in Fall of Giants about the new world that was created at the end of the war. About the, the Paris Peace Conference, the mistakes that were made there, the League of Nations, for which Woodrow Wilson right. had such high hopes. Right. Speaking of Woodrow Wilson, you, you mentioned several real characters, historical figures uh, that are woven into Fall of Giants, including Woodrow Wilson and Winston Churchill. How do you determine the line between history and fiction when you're writing a novel? Well, I th I, I'm careful about this because uh, I never want to violate history. I always, because I, I want to be able to say to readers, it's a novel, but the bits you read that are, are about history, about what really happened, are all true. I'll give you an example. There's a scene towards the end of the book, um, a conversation between a fictional character, Fitz, who you've mentioned, and the British Prime Minister, whose name is David Lloyd George. And they have this conversation. Fitz is very angry because there are two Russian Bolsheviks on a tour of Britain, and they're preaching communist propaganda. And Fitz is a conservative, and he's outraged by it. And he says to the prime minister, you should send these people home. You should, you should expel them from our country. And Lloyd George, who's a very canny politician, said, Bolshevism, the more the British people know about Bolshevism, the better. He said, Bolshevism is best viewed through the mists of, of distance. If British people learn what it's really like and what these Russians are actually like, they will like Bolshevism less and less. And so his idea was, let the British people learn all about it. He, said, he says to Fitz, the British people are not stupid. They, they know claptrap when they hear it, he said. <laughs> because then, then, as later, you know, Soviet speeches were interminably boring. Anyway, the point I'm, what I want to make is that everything that Lloyd George says in this scene to Fitz is, uh, is what he actually said at the time. And I took all his words from a memorandum he wrote, because lots of people were telling him he should expel uh, uh, Kamenev. Uh, and Krasin, uh, and he wrote a memo saying why he didn't want to do it. And he gave these reasons, these very kind of shrewd political reasons for not expelling these people. So in my scene, in my fictional scene in the book, there's this little altercation. Um, Lloyd George's words in the fictional scene are his actual words in real life. Hmm. Well, in real life, I was the wife of a strong politician for over 26 years. And you've been married to a politician. Your wife is a MP uh, at home. I think for over 13 years she's been yeah. in the parliament. What can you say you've gleaned from your wife uh, in terms of her politics in the UK? And was any of it brought into the novel? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, she. Uh, Barbara uh, was a, a member of parliament for 13 years, and for the last three years, she was a minister. She was in Gordon Brown's government. And um, also, um, you know, uh, lots and lots of other ministers, which our friends, the people, people we have dinner with and the people we go on holiday with, were all people who were running the country all this time. And that, I must say, was very helpful to me. LAUGHTER um, you know, it's things like, you learn things like, for example, I'll give you an example. One of Barbara's rules is never call a meeting until the result is a foregone conclusion. <laughs> See, you don't, you don't want to hold a meeting and say, what shall we do? You want to know beforehand what we're going to do. So, so what Barbara would do is call everybody uh, and say, if we have a meeting about this, what would your opinion be? And then she would make sure that the, the meeting was going to come to the decision that she wanted it to come to. And then she'd call the meeting. And, uh, that, and that's the way they all work. It's not just Barbara. That's the way, they, that's, that's the way careful 
politicians work. And so things like that. So I became very, uh, I became very comfortable with writing scenes in which these big political decisions are made because even though, well, you'll know this, even though I wasn't making them myself, I could see how they would, you know, we'd right. sit in a restaurant, I'd sit right. in the restu a restaurant with Barbara and uh, two or three men and women who were ministers in the, in the government and they, somebody would say, what are we gonna do about this? And somebody else would say, well, we can't do X. And, and then they'd resolve something, uh, um, you know, over, over steak and potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not gonna let you get out of here without telling us about your bass playing in Damn Right. <laughs> The band, damn right, I've got the blues. Tell us about that, and how long have you been playing? Well, this, this band, I've been playing the guitar since I was a kid. This band has actually been together for about 18 years. Uh, mm. at, at least the, the rhythm section has, the drummer and the rhythm guitarist and me. And actually, and we play, most Monday nights we rehearse in a rehearsal studio. And actually, if you play together for that length of time, you can't help but become sort of not bad. <laughs> um, so the band is quite good. With nobody, nobody wants to um, be in show business. With, they all have other jobs. Some of them are in the book business. Um, the rhythm guitarist is an agent, literary agent. The keyboard player is a poet, a published poet called Roger Stevens. And we have a wonderful singer who is actually a television personality in England, but she has written a book, a very, very good book actually, a memoir about... Um, uh, her life. She, she came from Trinidad to London in, when she was nine years old and had never been cold in her life, also never been hated in her life. And coming to London, she experienced both of those things as a mm. little kid, wrote a very, very good book, which is used in our schools now quite often. Interesting. And uh, anyway, so, so Floella is the singer. And, uh, and you know, the band is really quite good. I mean, when when yeah. we started, I used to say, oh, you know, it's the height of our ambition is to be barely adequate, I used to say. But actually, we're beyond that. Can now. they we're go on the bad. YouTube and hear you? Uh, well, the Hoochie Coochie Man? Yeah. The, well, the, <laughs> there are some YouTube clips, but the sound is never very okay. good on uh, YouTube. Okay. But there is a record, which um, uh, some, it's, it's called um, Stranger Than Fiction, and authors were asked to sing a song for this record for, uh, to raise money for Literacy Volunteers of America. And Stephen King did some tracks, and Norman Mailer did a couple of songs, and they asked me to do a song. So my band, we went into the studio, actually. We did it very seriously. We took two days, and we recorded Hoochie Coochie Man, which is probably the greatest blues of all time, written by <laughs> Willie Dixon. <laughs> and um, so you can, uh, you can download that if you really want to hear me sing. Because I'm singing on that, but that was before Floella joined us, so I'm, I was singing and playing the bass. Uh, you can actually download that, and, and I've got to tell you, it's not bad. All it's right, bad. okay, it's not bad. I'm, I'm and you know what? I probably can 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 predict that the next book in this trilogy is not going to be bad either. Thank uh, you. Quickly, the next book in the trilogy. What is that going to cover? Uh, it's well, I'm writing it at the moment. It's uh, it's called The Winter of the World. I've written the first chapter, which takes place in Berlin in 1933 and the principal character is only 11 years old at the time, uh, and she's the daughter of Maud. And they're in Berlin, and they see the very ominous and frightening uh, if developments of that year in Berlin, the, the brown shirts stamping down the streets and breaking people's windows and that kind of thing. Uh, all that's seen through the eyes of a, a rather frightened uh, young, a little girl. Um, and it will obviously, it will be about the Second World War, uh, and the late 40s, and it will end, I think, with the explosion of the first Soviet atom bomb. Oh, wow. Well, I've been talking with Ken Fowlett, author of Fall of Giants, book one in the Century Trilogy. Thank you so much, Ken, for allowing us to go between the lines with you today. My pleasure. Thank you. I've always been interested in the medieval period, and I thought that book really brought the medieval period to life. You Thank know, you. and I'm just kind of curious what you did on the to do the research for everyday living and and that kind of thing that you so brilliantly brought uh, up and made it so you know clear that uh, it wasn't all uh, kings and castles. You know. Thank you. Yes. Well, I was. Um, of course, a lot of what you need to know is in books. You do have to do a lot of reading. 
Uh, the other thing about that is, that as, an, as an author, there are certain things that I'm looking for. And you put, your, you put your finger right on it, because it's often the telling detail. You don't have to. In a novel, you don't have to tell readers everything there is to know about life in the Middle Ages. But if, but if you can find one or two details that, that, that sum everything up, then that will bring the period to life. And so that's what I'm looking for when I do the research. For example, I think the fact that um, in the monastery, uh, the, the monks were very hygienic people by the standards of the time, and twice a year they were obliged to have a haircut and a shave, and if necessary, a bath. <laughs> and that, uh, that, just that detail tells you everything you need to know about hygiene in the Middle Ages, doesn't it? So, <laughs> uh, but, and then the other thing I do, talking about details, is that I, for, for all of my books, uh, I show the first draft to a number of experts uh, who, who, who read it, and I, I, I pay people to do this because I want them to take it very seriously, uh, and they look for errors. And um, so my first draft is corrected by experts. Sometimes it might, it's often historians, but it might be police officers or scientists, people who, who know more about the subject than I do, who can um, find any accidental errors that I might have made. Yes, ma'am. I love everything you've done, and I'm very curious, where do you write, how do you stay on task, and what made you such a fantastic wordsmith? Uh, thank you. That's very nice of you to say mm -hmm. that. I, um, uh, I think most of us, most authors learn most of what we know by reading. Uh, I, I, my mother taught me to read before I went to school. I could read when I was four years old. I've, been a, uh, I've read for pleasure all my life. Got a huge, huge amount of pleasure from novels uh, all my life. And, but I, and I think that's, then you, you read... That's what teaches you, you know, what a sentence is and what a paragraph is and what a cliffhanger is, what, what narrative suspense is. You learn that by reading. Um, I write, I like to write in a library. I have three houses, I'm very lucky, and I have a library in each one, and I like to write surrounded by books, but it's not a big thing for me, um, the, the environment. I know there are, there are some writers who have to have darkness and silence and all that sort of thing. But I started as a newspaper reporter. And uh, of course, if you're, if you're in the newsroom uh, with people making phone calls and shouting and coming in and out, you can't say, would everybody please be quiet because I'm trying to write. <laughs> so I got used to writing in a sort of noisy atmosphere. So the environment doesn't. And in fact, um, uh, in fact I, I, I wrote quite a good scene today um, uh, coming from New York here to Atlanta in the, in the car to the airport and on the plane and so on. I wrote quite a good scene. And um, uh, uh, my companion from, from my publishers uh, was kind of surprised because we were in the Delta Lounge in New York and there was some dumb game show on TV. And every two minutes, I guess somebody won a prize. And, and if you're on a game show in this country and you win a prize, you have to scream. <laughs> And, and she was kind of surprised that I kept on writing this scene while, while um, the screaming was going on on the game show. And, it, you know, it, it wasn't that different from the, the newsroom of a newspaper about, you know, half an hour before the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> Up in the balcony. Following on that question a bit, and that is, is that uh, not just what times of day where you write, but your approach to writing, the, the vision of research, and, I mean, do you do your research first and then start with the story, or do you go off and on? That's one. And in the early, you have two different groups. You have the big canvas works that you're doing now, but they're the smaller pieces that you did when you did the espionage and you did the mysteries. Were there any group of writers in the beginning that influenced you more, and or did you just grow into this bigger phase without examples, or can you talk a bit to that? Thank well, you. I think, you know, my influence is it's hard to think of of, of writers whose style I've copied. The important influences were the writers who, who taught me that reading is a wonderful adventure. So, you know, the people who wrote those kids' books that I was reading when I was seven years old, borrowing from the public library, Enid Blyton is our great English writer, was our great English writer of kids' stories. When I was 12, I read 
a James Bond story, Live and Let Die. And I was just blown away by that. And um, I, uh, I, I wanted then, so when I started to write myself, I wanted to give people the excitement that I had got from the books I'd like best. So it's people like Ian Fleming who, um, not that I write like Ian Fleming, but, but uh, he, he taught me that this can be so terrifically exciting. You asked about my approach to writing. I'm a planner. I spend a long time planning the book, and I do most of the research while I'm planning it. So I'm thinking about what happens in chapter one, what happens in chapter two, and then maybe when I'm working on chapter two, I re I'll realize I don't know enough about some aspect of this story. So the next day, I'll read a book. I spend the whole day reading a book that's very relevant to my story. And then the day after, I'll come back to chapter two and write it in a new way because of what I've learned. I spend uh, quite a long time, six months to a year, on the plan. I then do a first draft, which takes me a year, maybe a bit more, and a rewrite, which is quicker. After I've written the first draft, I show it, as I said before, I show it to experts. I also show it to my editors, to my family, those of them that are interested. Some of my kids love to read my drafts. Others are, no, no, no. <laughs> um, which is fine, which is fine. Uh, and um, I have uh, one particular advisor who's been my agent for many years, Al Zuckerman, an agent in New York, uh, and he and I have been working on my books for 35 years, and he is particularly good at giving me suggestions as to how to improve on the first draft and make the second draft better. So that's the, those are the three phases, the planning the first draft and the second draft, and that's been working for me for, for some years now. When you say plan, do you mean outline? Yeah. Because you're a big outliner, I know that. That's right, yeah. So I, write an, okay. yeah. I write an outline, it, by, the, by the end it's generally First time I do it, of course, it might be three lines on a sheet of paper. It's just the basic idea for the story. But by the time I finished, it's 40 or 50 typed pages saying what happens in every chapter and who the characters are. Mr. Follett, I'm fascinated by World War I. I'm interested to know if you had a favorite reference work about the war uh, or one that was most useful to you. Um, uh, there were... I'm trying to remember the name of this book. One of the things that struck me very vividly uh, was that uh, people were recruited um, in towns and districts and sometimes in factories, and uh, they en then entered a battalion which consisted of, uh, of, the, the, of people from their town. And... Um, uh, this, was, this was a new idea in Britain in the First World War. Um, and it, it was it's very striking because, of course, then when there was a big battle, the town would be devastated because if the battalion was in the middle of the battle, then, then half the people would be killed. And it was a terrible tragedy for the town. So they stopped doing that. They started mixing people up so that there would never be one of these awful moments when half the young men in the town were reported killed. Mm -hmm in battle, and I'm trying to think of the book. There's a book about those battalions, um, and um, if, you, um, if you send me, a, leave a message for me on my website, I'll give you the name of it when I get back home. I can't remember it, but I, that was one of the aspects of the, of the war that I found most moving. Okay, I see a lot of you with books to be signed, so let's just take two more questions. Let's go to the lady up in the balcony. Okay, I have two questions. Where is your favorite historic travel destination, and what is your favorite book of all time? What was the first question? Favorite. Favorite historic travel destination. Travel destination. Oh, travel destination. Historic travel destination. Okay, historic. Uh, well, it's obviously it's going to be a cathedral. I'm just thinking which one. <laughs> uh, I think I'd say Salisbury. And I'll tell you why, and, you, and if you ever get a chance to go to Salisbury in England, there is a, it's a very beautiful cathedral, and it's all in one style, because it was built quite quickly. It's also, it also looks like the illustrations in the Pillars of the Earth of Kingsbridge Cathedral when it's finally finished. Salisbury is very, it's very beautiful, um, but you can also, two, two miles outside the town, you can visit what's called Old Sarum, which is where the city used to be uh, before, uh, before um, in the very early Middle Ages, Old Sarum was. And you can see the foundations of 
not just the old cathedral, but the old castle and the entire town. And that's a great visit because you can see, as it were, two, you, you, you can see two eras in medieval history uh, in the same trip, and it's a very interesting comparison. So that would be my favorite historic travel destination. And my all-time favorite book, I, okay, this changes every time I'm asked because right. it depends, you know. <laughs> but um, uh, I'm a big fan of Edith Wharton, American novelist who, who was active around about, um, the, around about 1900, 1910. American novelist who lived in, lived in France, actually. Uh, she writes about um, wealthy and rather uptight New Yorkers. Um, and her best book, I think, is called The House of Mirth. It's a sad, I hear murmurs from the audience. Some of you love it. Do you love that House of Mirth? Isn't it a wonderful book? It's a sad book, actually. Um, has, has a very unhappy ending, but um, uh, it's about a woman who comes to grief because she always makes the right moral decision. And that just takes her on a terrible downhill journey. It's a wonderful novel. Anyway. <laughs> there you are. I've done a rotten job of selling that book to you. 